Chapter 74 Cry of the Elephant Queen Venerable Sariputta and Moggallana returned to Bamboo Forest after spending a little over a month at Gaya Sissa. The bhikkhus joyously welcomed them back. They asked the two venerables about the situation at Gaya Sissa, but Sariputta and Moggallana only smiled. A few days later, more than 300 bhikkhus from David Atta's Sangha returned to Bamboo Forest. The bhikkhus at Bamboo Forest were overjoyed and they greeted their Gaius's brothers warmly. Four days later, Venerable Sariputta took an exact count of the brothers who had returned from Gaius's and learned that there were 380 in all. He led them together with Venerable Moggallana to Vulture Peak to have an audience with the Buddha. As he stood outside his hut, the Buddha watched the bhikkhus being led up the mountain by his two senior disciples. Other bhikkhus who lived on Vulture Peak came out of their huts to greet the returning monks. Sariputta and Moggallana left the monks for a moment in order to speak privately with the Buddha. They bowed to the Buddha, who invited them to sit down. The Venerable Sariputta smiled and said, Lord Buddha, we have brought back nearly 400 bhikkhus. The Buddha said, you have done well, but tell me, how were you able to open their eyes? Venerable Moggallana explained, Lord, when we first arrived, Brother David Dalta had just finished eating and was preparing to give a Dharma talk. He looked very much as though he was trying to imitate you. When he looked up and saw us approaching, he appeared enormously pleased. He invited Sariputta to sit next to him on the Dharma platform, but Sariputta refused and chose to sit by one side instead. I sat on the other side. David Atta then addressed the other bhikkhus. He said, Today, Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Moggallana have joined us. They were my close friends in the past. Let me take this chance to invite Venerable Sariputta to give the Dharma talk today. David Atta turned to Sariputta and joined his palms. My brother accepted the invitation to speak. He spoke about the Four Noble Truths in a most beautiful way. All the bhikkhus listened as if spellbound. But I noticed Devadatta's eyes growing heavy, as if he wanted to fall asleep. No doubt he was tired from all his recent activities. Halfway through the Dharma talk, he was fast asleep. We stayed at Gaya Sissa for more than a month and participated in all the activities there. Every three days, Brother Sariputta gave a Dharma talk. He instructed the bhikkhus with all his heart. Once I noticed Bhikkhu Kokalita, Devadatta's chief advisor, whisper something to Devadatta, but Devadatta seemed to pay him little attention. I suspect Kokalita was warning him not to trust us. Devadatta, however, was glad to have someone assume responsibility for teaching the Dharma, especially when it was someone as capable as my brother Sariputta. One day, after delivering a discourse on the four establishments of mindfulness, Sariputta said, This afternoon, my brother and I will be leaving you to return to the Buddha and the Sangha he leads. Dear brothers, there is only one fully enlightened master, and that is the teacher Gautama. The Buddha founded the Sangha of Bhikkhus. He is the source for all of us. I know you would be warmly welcomed back by the Buddha if you returned. Dear brothers, there is nothing more painful than seeing a community divided. I have met only one true master in my life, and that is the Buddha. We will depart from you today, 
but should any of you decide to return to the Buddha, please come to Bamboo Forest. We will meet you there and take you to meet the Buddha on Vulture Peak. That day Devadatta was in the capital on business, but Venerable Kokkalita, who'd been hostile to us since our arrival, stood up to protest. He even hurled curses at us, but we simply stood up and pretended not to hear. We silently took our bowls and extra robes and left Gaia to return to Venuvana. We stayed at Venuvana for five days. 380 bhikkhus from Gaia followed shortly. Venerable Sariputta asked, Lord, do these bhikkhus need to be reordained? If necessary, I will organise an ordination ceremony for them before they meet with you. The Buddha said, That is not necessary, Sariputta. It will be adequate for them to make a confession before the community. The two senior disciples bowed and rejoined the waiting bhikkhus. Over the next few days, 35 more bhikkhus left Gaya Sissa. Sariputta arranged a confession ceremony for them and then presented them to the Buddha. Venerable Ananda spoke to the 35 newest arrivals and asked them about the situation at Gaya Sissa. They told him that after Venerable Devadatta had returned from Rajagaha and learned that nearly 400 bhikkhus had abandoned him to return to the Buddha, his face turned scarlet in anger. He refused to speak to anyone for several days. Ananda asked, What did Brothers Sariputta and Magalana say to you that made you want to leave Brother Devadatta and return to the Buddha? One of the bhikkhus answered, They never spoke a critical word against Venerable Devadatta or the Gaya Sissa Sangha. They merely taught the Dharma with all their hearts. Most of us have only been ordained two or three years and still lack the stability and depth in our practice. When we heard Brother Sariputta's Dharma talks and received personal instruction from Brother Moggallana, we saw how marvellous and sublime the teaching of the Buddha truly is. The presence of Venerables Sariputta and Moggallana with their profound understanding and virtue was like the presence of the Buddha himself. We realised that although Venerable Devadatta speaks with great skill, he could not compare with them. After Venerables Sariputta and Moggallana departed, Many of us discussed these things and reached the decision to return to the Buddha. Ananda asked, And what did Bhikkhu Kokalita do when you left? He was enraged. He cursed us, but that only made us all the more determined to leave. One afternoon, as the Buddha stood on the mountain slope admiring the evening sky, he heard a shout from below. Watch out, Lord! A boulder is about to crash behind you! The Buddha looked back to see a boulder the size of a cattle cart crashing down the mountain towards him. It was difficult to move out of the way in time as the mountain path was suddenly covered with sharp and jutting stones. By a stroke of luck, the boulder was blocked by two other rocks on the mountainside just before reaching the Buddha. But the impact of rock against rock sent a fragment flying which pierced the Buddha's foot. Blood gushed from his wound and stained his robes. Looking up, the Buddha saw a man at the top of the mountain running away quickly. His wound was very painful. He folded his Sangati in four and placed it on the earth. He sat down on it in a lotus position and began to concentrate on his breath in order to calm the pain. Bhikkhus came running towards him. 
one exclaimed, this is surely the work of Devadatta. Another said, brothers, let us divide ourselves into patrols to guard the mountain and protect the Lord Buddha. Let's not lose any time. Everyone ran round in circles, disturbing the previously calm evening. The Buddha said, Brothers, please do not shout. Nothing warrants such noise. The Tathagata does not need to be guarded or protected. Please return to your huts. Ananda, send the novice Kunda for the physician Jivaka. They obeyed the Buddha's wishes. Jivaka came up to Vulture Peak in no time at all and asked that the Buddha be carried in a palanquin down to the mangrove. Within a few short days, people in the capital learned of the two attempts on the Buddha's life. They were shocked and dismayed. Not only that, but they received the announcement that King Bimbisara had died. Through unknown channels, the people learned how he had died under house arrest. Agony filled the people's hearts. They looked towards Vulture Peak as a symbol of moral resistance. As they grieved for their king, their admiration for the Buddha deepened. Although the Buddha had chosen to remain silent about recent events, his silence had been well understood by the people. King Bimbisara was 67 years old when he died. He was five years younger than the Buddha. He'd taken the three refuges with the Buddha when he was just 31 years old. Having ascended to the throne at the age of 15, he then reigned for 52 years. It was he who rebuilt the capital of Rajgaha after it had been destroyed by fire. Throughout his reign, Magda had enjoyed continuous peace, with the exception of one short war with the kingdom of Anga. King Brahmadatta of Anga lost the war, and Anga temporarily fell under the jurisdiction of Magda. When King Taxila Pukasati later assumed the throne in Anga, King Bimbasara maintained close and friendly relations with him to prevent future conflicts. Thanks to that, the new king also became a disciple of the Buddha. King Bimbasara had always understood the importance of maintaining good relations with neighbouring kingdoms. He married Princess Kosala Devi, the younger sister of King Pasanadi of Kosala and made her his queen. He also took wives from the Madra and Lichavi dynasties. His elder sister was married to the king of Kosala. King Bimbisara showed his deep love and respect for the Buddha by having a stupa built in the royal gardens that contained the Buddha's hair and fingernails. Incense and candles were regularly lit round the foot of the stupa to express gratitude for the Buddha's teaching. The king entrusted Sri Mati, a lady-in-waiting at the palace, with the stupa's upkeep. Sri Mati attended all the plants and flowers around the stupa and kept the area well swept. Just ten days after the boulder was hurled at the Buddha, he and several bhikkhus were begging in the capital when Venerable Ananda looked up to see an elephant charging towards them. It appeared to have escaped from the royal stables. He recognised it was the elephant named Nalagiri, infamous for its violent behaviour. Ananda could not understand how the royal keeper could have allowed it to escape. Panic-stricken, people ran for cover. The elephant raised its trunk, lifted its ears, and headed straight for the Buddha. Ananda grabbed the Buddha's arm to lead him to safety, but the Buddha would not budge. 
he stood calmly, unperturbed. Some bhikkhus cowered behind him, while others fled. People shouted at the Buddha to save himself. Ananda held his breath and stepped forward to place his body between the Buddha and Nalagiri. At that very moment, to Ananda's surprise, the Buddha let out a majestic cry. It was the cry of the Elephant Queen the Buddha had befriended long ago, a Rakhita forest in Paralikyaka. Nalagiri was but a few yards from the Buddha when he heard the resounding cry, and he came to a sudden halt. The mighty elephant knelt on all fours and lowered his head to the ground as if to bow to the Buddha. The Buddha gently stroked Nalagiri's head and then holding the elephant's trunk in one hand, led an obedient Nalagiri back to the royal stables. People applauded and cheered. Ananda smiled. He thought back to the days when they were youngsters. The young Siddhartha had known no equal in the martial arts. He excelled at everything archery, weightlifting, swordsmanship, horse racing, and today the Buddha had treated an elephant on the rampage as though he were an old and docile friend. The bhikkhus and a large crowd followed the Buddha and the elephant back to the stables. When they arrived, the Buddha gave the keeper a stern look, but then spoke in a compassionate voice. The Tathagata does not need to know who ordered you to release this elephant, but you should understand the seriousness of your action. Dozens, even hundreds of people could have been killed. You must never allow such a thing to happen again. The keeper bowed before the Buddha. The Buddha helped him back to his feet and then joined the bhikkhus to resume begging. The Buddha and all his bhikkhus attended King Bimbisara's funeral. The ceremony was an event of great solemnity and beauty. The people grieved the passing of their beloved monarch and showed up in dense crowds to pay their final respects. More than 4,000 bhikkhus were present. When the funeral was over, the Buddha spent the night at Jivaka's mango grove before returning to Vulture Peak. The physician informed him that the former queen, Videhi, had been forbidden to visit the king at all in the past month. The king passed from this life all alone. They found him lying before his favourite window. His eyes were turned towards Vulture Peak when he took his last breath. Shortly after the king's funeral, Jivaka brought Prince Abharaja, son of Bimbisara, and his wife Padmavati to see the Buddha. The prince requested to take the vows as a bhikkhu. He told the Buddha that since his father's death, he had lost all enthusiasm for a life of fame or wealth. He had heard many of the Buddha's Dharma talks and felt drawn to the path of enlightenment. He desired nothing more than to lead the peaceful, unburdened life of a bhikkhu. The Buddha accepted Prince Abhayaraja into the Sangha of bhikkhus. Chapter 75 Tears of Happiness Ten days later, the Buddha put on his outer robe, took his begging bowl and left the city of Rajagaha. He headed north across the Ganga, stopped along the way to visit the Kutagara Monastery, and then made his way to Savati. It would soon be the rainy season again, and he needed to return to Jetavana 
to prepare for the annual retreat. Venerables Ananda, Sariputta, Moggallana and 300 other bhikkhus accompanied him. When they reached Savati, the Buddha walked directly to Jetavana. Many bhikkhus and bhikkhunis had gathered to await his arrival. They had heard of events in Magda and were relieved to see the Buddha unharmed and in good health. Bhikkhuni Kema was present. She now served as the abbess to the bhikkhunis. King Pasanadi came to see the Buddha the moment he learned of his arrival. He asked the Buddha about the situation in Rajgaha and listened as the Buddha recounted everything, including his meeting with Queen Videhi, King Pasanadi's own sister. The Buddha told him that while she maintained a calm composure, he knew her heart was filled with grief and sorrow. King Pasanadi told the Buddha that he had already sent a delegation to Rajgaha to ask Ajatasattu, his nephew, to explain the imprisonment of King Bimbisara. A month had already passed, but no response had been received. King Pasanadi sent further word that if the new king deemed it necessary, he would come to Savati in person to explain the situation. King Pasanadi informed the Buddha that in order to demonstrate his opposition to events in Magda, he had reclaimed the territory he had offered to Magda many years ago on the occasion of his sister's marriage to King Bimbisara. This land was located close to the city of Varanasi in Kasi. The first day of the retreat season arrived. All the spiritual centres and monasteries in the region were filled to overflowing with bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. Every ten days, the Buddha gave a Dharma talk at Jetavana to all the monks and nuns. These talks always took place following the noon meal. Monks and nuns who walked from more distant centres did not have enough time to go begging if they wanted to arrive in time for the discourse. Lay disciples in the city worked hard to assure that there was always enough food waiting for these monks and nuns. The first Dharma talk the Buddha delivered that season was on the subject of happiness. He told the assembly that happiness is real and can be realised in the very midst of daily life. First of all, the Buddha said, Happiness is not the result of gratifying sense desires. Sense pleasures give the illusion of happiness, but in fact they are sources of suffering. It is like a leper who is forced to live alone in the forest. His flesh is racked with terrible pain day and night. So he digs a pit and makes a fierce fire and he stands over it to seek temporary relief from his pain by toasting his limbs over the fire. It's the only way he can feel any comfort. But miraculously, after a few years, his disease goes into remission and he's able to return to a normal life in the village. One day he enters the forest and sees a group of lepers toasting their limbs over hot flames just as he once did. He is filled with pity for them, for he knows that in his healthy state he could never bear to hold his limbs over such fierce flames. If someone tried to drag him over the fire, he would resist with all his might. He understands that what he once took to be a comfort is actually a source of pain to one who is healthy. The Buddha said, sense pleasures are like a pit of fire. They bring happiness only to those who are ill. A healthy person shuns the flames of sense desires. The Buddha explained that the source of true happiness is living in ease and freedom, fully experiencing the wonders of life. 
Happiness is being aware of what is going on in the present moment, free from both clinging and aversion. A happy person cherishes the wonders taking place in the present moment. A cool breeze, the morning sky, a golden flower, a violet bamboo tree, the smile of a child. A happy person can appreciate these things without being bound by them. Understanding all dharmas as impermanent and without a separate self, a happy person does not become consumed even by such pleasures. A happy person thus lives in ease, free from all worry and fear. Because he understands that a flower will soon wilt, he is not sad when it does. A happy person understands the nature of birth and death of all dharmas. His happiness is true happiness, and he does not even worry about or fear his own death. The Buddha told the assembly that some people believe it is necessary to suffer in the present in order to have happiness in the future. They make sacrifices and endure hardships of body and mind, thinking they can acquire happiness in the future. But life exists only in the present moment. That kind of sacrifice is a waste of life. Other people think if you want to enjoy peace, joy and liberation in the future, you must practice self-mortification in the present. They practice austerities, starve themselves and inflict pain in their minds and bodies. The Buddha taught that such practices cause suffering for the person in both the present and the future. Still others contend that because life is so fleeting, they should not concern themselves with the future at all. They may try to safety all their sense desires in the present moment. The Buddha explained that clinging to sense pleasures in this way causes suffering in both the present and the future. The path that the Buddha taught avoided both extremes. He taught that the most intelligent way is to live a way that fosters happiness for both present and for the future. The way of liberation does not force austerities on the body in the hope of attaining future happiness. A bhikkhu creates happiness for himself and for all those around him in the present moment by the way in which he eats his daily meal, meditates and practices the four establishments of mindfulness, the four limitless meditations and the full awareness of breathing. Eating only one meal a day keeps his body healthy and light and allows more time for spiritual practice. Living in ease and freedom he is better able to help others. Bhikkhus remain celibate and childless, not as a practice of austerity, but as a means of being more free to help others. The bhikkhu is able to see happiness that is present in each moment of daily life. If he feels his chastity deprives him of happiness, he is not living the spirit of the teaching. A bhikkhu who practices the teaching of celibacy according to its true spirit radiates ease, peace and joy. Such a life brings happiness in both the present and future. After the Dharma talk, Lay disciple Punala Lakana asked the Buddha if she could speak to him. She told the Buddha that her husband, Sudata Anattapindaka, had fallen gravely ill. He was in such great pain he was unable to attend the Dharma talk. His condition was steadily worsening. He feared that he would die before having a chance to see the Buddha one last time. The next day, the Buddha, together with Venerable Sariputta and Ananda, 
went to visit Sudatta. Sudatta was deeply moved to see them. His face was pale and drawn, and he could barely sit up. The Buddha said to him, Sudatta, your entire life has been filled with meaning and happiness. You have relieved the suffering of countless others, moving the people to bestow on you the name Anattapindika, the one who cares for the poor and abandoned. Jetavana Monastery is one of your many fine accomplishments. You've constantly contributed to efforts to spread the Dharma. You've lived according to the teaching and have thus created true happiness for yourself, your family and many others. You can rest now. I will ask Venerable Sariputta to visit you often and to provide you special guidance. Do not try to come to the monastery. You should reserve your strength. Sudatta joined his palms in gratitude. Fifteen days later, the Buddha gave a Dharma talk on lay life. He told the laity how they could realise true happiness in their daily lives. He reviewed the principle of living for peace in the present, peace for the future, which he had presented in his previous Dharma talk to the monks and nuns. He also said, a bhikkhu lives a celibate life in order to enjoy peace and joy in the present moment. Such a life assures future happiness as well. But homeless bhikkhus are not the only ones who can enjoy such happiness. Lay disciples living in the world can follow the principles of the teaching to foster true happiness. First of all, do not let a desire for wealth cause you to become so consumed by your work that you prevent happiness for yourself and your family in the present moment. Happiness is foremost. A look filled with understanding, an accepting smile, a loving word, a meal shared in warmth and awareness are the things that create happiness in the present moment. By nourishing awareness in the present moment, you can avoid causing suffering to yourself and to those around you. The way you look at others, your smile and your small acts of caring can create happiness. True happiness does not depend on wealth or fame. The Buddha recalled a conversation he had had with a merchant named Sigala several years previously at Rajgaha. One morning, the Buddha left bamboo forest with his begging bowl, just as daylight was breaking. He came upon a young man on the path just outside the city. Sagala was bowing to the six directions of east, west, south, north, down and up. The Buddha stopped and asked him the purpose of his bowing. Sigala said that his father had taught him as a child to bow to the six directions every morning. He liked to obey his father's wishes, but he did not actually know the purpose of the ritual. The Buddha told him, bowing is a practice that can foster happiness for both the present and the future. He told Sigala that as he bowed to the east, he should contemplate gratitude to his parents. When he bowed to the south, he should contemplate gratitude to his teachers. Bowing to the west, he should contemplate love for his wife and children. Bowing to the north, he should contemplate love for his friends. Bowing down, he could contemplate gratitude to his co-workers. Bowing up, he could contemplate gratitude to all wise and virtuous persons. The Buddha taught Sagala the five precepts and how to look deeply at things in order to avoid acting out of greed, anger, passion or fear. The Buddha told Sagala 
to avoid the six actions which lead to ruin. Abusing alcohol, wandering through the city streets late at night, frequenting places of gambling, visiting places of depravity, loitering with persons of poor character and succumbing to laziness. In addition, he told Sagala how to determine who was worthy of being considered a good friend. He said, a good friend is constant, whether you are rich or poor, happy or sad, successful or unsuccessful. A good friend is one whose feelings for you do not waver. A good friend listens to you and shares your suffering. He shares his own joys and sorrows with you while regarding your joys and sorrows as his own. The Buddha continues his Dharma talk by saying, true happiness can be realized in this very life, especially when you observe the following. One, foster relations with people of virtue and avoid the path of degradation. Two, Live in an environment that is conducive to spiritual practice and builds good character. 3. Foster opportunities to learn more about the Dharma, the precepts, on your own trade in greater depth. 4. Take the time to care well for your parents, spouse and children. 5. Share time, resources and happiness with others. 6. Foster opportunities to cultivate virtue. Avoid alcohol and gambling. 7. Cultivate humility, gratitude and simple living. 8. Seek opportunities to be close to bhikkhus in order to study the way. 9. Live a life based on the Four Noble Truths. 10. Learn how to meditate in order to release sorrows and anxieties. The Buddha praised lay disciples who lived the teaching in their daily lives within their families and society. He made special mention of Sudatta Anattapindaka. He said that Sudatta was an exemplar of one who devoted all his efforts to creating a life full of meaning, service and happiness. Sudatta's heart was truly deep. His entire life had been guided by the teaching. The Buddha said that people who owned far greater wealth than Sudatta would not find it easy to match the happiness he had created for others. Sudatta's wife, Punalakana, was moved to tears by the Buddha's praise for her husband. She stood up and respectfully addressed the Buddha. Lord, a wealthy person's life is often very busy, especially when he owns many things. I think that maintaining a small and modest vocation would be more conducive to spiritual practice. When we see the bhikkhus, free of home and family, who own little more than a bowl, we long for a more simple, carefree life for ourselves. We would like to live a leisurely life too, but we're bound by so many responsibilities. What can we do? The Buddha answered, Punalakana, bhikkhus have responsibilities too. A celibate life requires a bhikkhu to live mindfully by the precepts day and night. A bhikkhu devotes his life to others. Lay disciples, the Tathagata wishes to suggest a way by which you can taste the like for the bhikkhu twice a month or so. We shall call this practice the eight observances of the laity. Twice a month you can come to the monastery and follow these practices for a day and a night. Like the bhikkhus, you will eat only one meal. You can practice sitting and walking meditation. For 24 hours, you can enjoy a celibate, aware, 
concentrated, relaxed, peaceful and joyous life as if you were a monk or a nun. When the day is over, you can return to your secular life, observing the five precepts and the three refuges as usual. Lay disciples, the Tathagata will inform the bhikkhus about the eight observances of the laity. These special days of practice can be organised at temples or even in your own homes. You can invite bhikkhus to your homes to administer the eight observances and to offer teaching on your day of practice. Punalakana was pleased with the Buddha's suggestion. She asked, Please, Lord, what are the eight observances? The Buddha answered, Do not steal, do not kill, do not engage in sexual activity, do not lie, do not use alcohol, do not adorn yourself with jewellery, do not sit or lie on a fancy bed, and do not use money. These eight observances can prevent mindfulness and confusion. Eating only one meal on your day of practice will allow more time for your practice. The people were happy with the Buddha's suggestion for special days of practice for the laity. Ten days later, a servant from Sudhata's household came to inform Venerable Sariputta that Siddhartha's illness had taken a turn for the worse. Sariputta asked Ananda to join him, and together they walked into the city. They found Siddhartha lying on his bed. The servant pulled two chairs close to the bed for the bhikkhus. Knowing that Siddhartha was suffering greatly in his body, Venerable Sariputta advised him to practice contemplating on the Buddha the Dharma and the Sangha, to ease the pain. Lay disciple Siddhartha, let us contemplate together on the Buddha, the Enlightened One, on the Dharma, the way of understanding and love, and on the Sangha, the noble community which lives in harmony and awareness. Knowing that Siddhartha did not have much longer to live, Venerable Sariputta told him, Lay disciple Siddhartha, let us contemplate as follows. My eyes are not me, my ears are not me, my nose, my tongue, my body and my mind are not me. Siddhartha followed Sariputta's instructions. Then Sariputta continued. Now let us continue to contemplate. That which I see is not me. That which I hear is not me. That which I smell, taste, touch and think are not me. Sariputta then showed Sudatta how to contemplate on the six sense consciousnesses. Seeing is not me. Hearing is not me. Smelling, tasting, touching and thinking are not me. Sariputta continued, the element earth is not me. The elements water, fire, air, space and consciousness are not me. I am not bound or restrained by the elements. Birth and death cannot touch me. I smile because I have never been born and I will never die. Birth does not give me existence. Death does not take existence away. Suddenly Sudatta began to weep. Startled to see tears roll down the lay disciple's cheeks, Ananda asked him, Are you upset, Sudatta, because you are unable to follow the contemplation? Sudatta answered, Venerable Ananda, I am not upset at all. I am able to follow the contemplation without any difficulty. I weep because I am so deeply moved. For more than 30 years I have had the honour of serving the Buddha and the bhikkhus, but I have never heard a more sublime 
more profound teaching than this teaching today. Ananda said, Sudata, the Lord frequently offers this kind of teaching to the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. Venerable Ananda, lay disciples are also able to understand and practice such a teaching. Please ask Lord Buddha to share this teaching with the laity. Sudatta died later that day. Venerable Sariputta and Ananda remained with him and continued to recite sutras over his body. Anattapindaka's family was a model for all other families. All the members of his family took refuge in the Buddha and devoted themselves to studying and applying the Dharma in their daily lives. A few days before his death, Siddhartha learned that his youngest daughter, Sumagada, was sharing the teaching with the people in Anga. She had married a man from Anga, who was a governor and devout follower of the unclothed ascetics. When he asked her to visit the ascetics with him, she diplomatically declined. Over time, her solid understanding of the Buddha's way touched her husband and opened the hearts of many people in their region. 